Don't be bored. Okay, <clears throat> a fuel a fuel cell. Special topics two test fourteen from chapter eighteen. Right? Got that? Uh, fuel cell produces electricity from what and what? Hydrogen and oxygen. So, what is hydrogen and oxygen? Water. Water. Yeah. If in the right concentration, you know, H2O. Two uh, incidentally, the EPA is wanting to claim that water vapor is a greenhouse gas. What the heck? Why? Because that's what, where's where most global warming comes from, water vapor. And they're trying to figure out a way they can regulate us. You know, we don't want to see, if you breathe out water vapor, they're going to tax that. <laughs> but that's what they're actually, they actually classify water vapor as a greenhouse gas. Water vapor no, tax credits. No, yeah. Oh, they're going, they're going crazy. Okay. Uh, what are the byproducts from a fuel cell? CO2. Water. Water. Give Sean a cigar. He's done his homework. <laughs> well, what's happening? What happens when fuel burns anyway? <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, at a molecular level, what's happening when fuel's burning? Oxygen is <laughs> the molecules are, are un oxygen is uniting with something, and so if oxygen unites with hydrogen. You're going to have water, right? What type of fuel cell is the most likely to be used to power vehicles? Now, this is going to be one that if you hadn't read the chapter, you're going to get uh, messed up. And I need somebody to tell me what. This is PEM, P-E-M. What does that stand for? Somebody It's somebody's job to tell me what P-E-M stands for. Permanent electromagnetism. <laughs> you can't guess at it. All right. Which liquid fuel could be used to directly power a fuel cell? Which liquid fuel... Could be directly power fuel cell. You could actually uh, probably do a phone search on that. Type in PEM fuel cell. West, oh, is, that right? West is a super fast phone searcher, huh? Is that right? What? Permanent <laughs> electromagnet? Come on, you're making it up as you go. All right. Which liquid fuel could be used to directly power a fuel cell? Methanol. 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 Uh, okay, now which is not a function of an ultra capacitor? Hold on, hold on. PEM. Yeah, PEM fuel cell. What do you see there? Wikipedia. Huh? Proton exchange membrane. Whoa, now you know what it stands for. Proton exchange membrane is what a PEM fuel cell is. It says fuel, water, and... The more you read, the smarter you're going to be. Re leaders are readers. Hey, there, right, Brandon. Pardon me? I'm a reader. I'm a reader. I'm a reader, and in this class, I'm your leader, okay? <laughs> now, I can't help you at Huddle House, but I can't help you here. Right. Brandon made the funniest face the other day. I said, Docs is going to start serving breakfast on Monday morning. You know, all these, you know, the, uh, I mean, I'm not just on Monday morning, but I think Monday's when they're going to actually open to the public for serving breakfast, I think. It's going to be the day or, like, day or two. And then he says, uh, they're going to have good breakfast. He goes, better Huddle House? I said, yep. Anything yeah. like better than Huddle House? Bad yeah, for real. Huddle House is where you go. When well, it was good when Brandon was cooking there, from what I understand. They lost about half of their customer base when Brandon stopped cooking there. <laughs> Okay, which is which is not a function of an ultra capacitor. Okay, we're wasting time. Oh, ultra, what's number three? Oh, number three is uh, is PIM. Oh, it is PIM, yeah. And then you can use methanol. That's number four, which is not a function of an ultra capacitor. It can pass DC current. That is not a function of an ultra capacitor. It cannot pass DC current. Hydrogen is commonly stored at what pressure? So which one is it? It, yeah, it's D. It's a dog. Hydrogen is commonly stored at what pressure? Since it's so reactive, I would assume it would be stored at a lower pressure. 5,000 PSI. Which is lower than 50,000 or 100,000. Right? I, I would assume it was either A or C. Yeah. Well, C, yeah. Uh, yeah, one of the lower pressures, yeah. Hydrogen storage tanks are usually constructed from what? Aluminum. Both B and C, steel, um, excuse me, aluminum and carbon fiber. I don't know why I was trying to put steel. 
Okay, both. Uh, carbon fiber are, is strong. Yeah, it really yeah. is. They make springs out of that and stuff. Now, carbon fiber. Mm-hmm. There was this guy that I, that I met when I was at a uh, Power Stroke Diesel uh, rally that one year writing an article for Motor Age. And uh, he was all—he was another writer. There was a bunch of us journalists up there, and he said that this one guy had figured out a way to make carbon fiber springs for this SUV that he was building, and he got interested in that, and so he went and talked to the guy. And it took a long time to build them, and it's aggravating and it's hard to do. But when you get them built, you got a spring that's stronger than steel. That's really something, and it's lightweight, just really cool. Yeah, and he said so. He wrote an article about that uh, and put it. It was published in some magazine. And this guy was getting hundreds of phone calls a day for people pulling some plastic and stuff, but they won't. This this here's got a actually an acrylic sealer that goes on and keeps them good, looking good. Okay, HCCI is a process that eliminates the ignition system. And somebody uh, needs to tell me what HCCI is. Do I got to do it? Yeah. Sean, you got a smartphone? Yeah. What are you doing? He's actually. I would assume it's something to do with habit. No, I ain't no assuming. You got you got a smartphone. Yeah. Well, Sean's pretty smart. He comes up with a lot of good answers. Sean, Sean actually comes up with really smart stuff, but sometimes some of the answers he comes up with are loopy. He was uh, <laughs> a plug-in hybrid is different from a conventional hybrid electric vehicle because it has what? There's a whole bunch of HCCI. There's health. There's humors. No, what you got to do is you. I would put H, H, I would put H, compression ignition. Oh, huh, there you. What was it? Homogenous. Homogenous, yeah, that word, charge compression ignition. Homogenous charge compression ignition. I mean, you know, it's lighting off on compression, isn't it? Okay. Uh, a plug-in hybrid is different from a conventional hybrid electric vehicle because what? What does it have? There's a bunch of... What does a plug-in hybrid have that's different from conventional hybrid electric? A good-end battery? Well, it's got more batteries. Oh, uh, so it's like a... Like, uh, this is this, that HCCI is like this. Very similar. Okay, uh, a built-in battery charger is also on the other way. You know, when you hit the brakes, they're going to charge your batteries. See, yes. All of them charge your battery when you hit the brake. If you see that screen, you see, you see that screen on the center of the console, it's giving you this little graphic of where the power is coming from. It's driving a car That's and charging cool. all that You hit the brake, it charges the battery. And you remember that video I showed of that thing we were turning the crank and all that? That's how it does it. Do you ever notice how whenever you kept, whenever an alternator starts putting out when it wasn't putting out before it loads the engine? You know what? Like you got an alternator that for some reason not putting out. And all of a sudden, oh crap, I forgot to plug the wires into the alternator. When you plug them in, all of a sudden the engine slows down because the alternator's putting a load on the I engine. I just reached the door. You can't be an idiot and not put the cable right on the alternator. <laughs> Who did that? Yeah. <laughs> Why do they keep going this? Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I went and checked I feel like dirt. jumped him off 10, 15 times. And he figured out the battery. When he well, you know, the thing about it is you always got to have power at that connection. And all that. I, mean, boy. I tell you what will really mess you up, and we talk about this in electrical class. Uh, anytime you're checking a charging system, and I hammer on this all the time, you switch that key on, and you look for the battery light. Just about every car's got a battery light. Even if they got a gauge, they got a battery light on the day. If you don't see that battery light, uh, well, they'll have a gauge, but they'll typically have a battery light indicator light too. Typically, and that's usually. If it's got a battery light on the dash and that light ain't burning, you better find out why. Because that, huh? Huh? When you just switch it on, that battery light ought to come on. Oh, okay. If that battery light, if you switch it on without starting it, and that battery light doesn't come on. That could be the reason it's not charging. Yep. Because that power that's going through that battery light is going to that regulator and turning it on. See what I mean? I this mean, the regulator's going to be turned on like any other device. This man brought a Mustang over here to us. With nothing working on it. Charging system, running light, hammered dog, mm-hmm. and uh, microphone in the dog. They had the O2 sensors. They got the, the, the bones. Loaded up, O2 sensor still plugged in, tie wrapped to the front of the room. Yeah. And the man said that Michael destroyed his car. Yeah. Yeah. Michael destroyed the car. Michael fixed it though, or what? Michael fixed it. Yeah. He didn't fix the O2, the O2 sensors now. Yeah. Uh, Michael fixed it where it was ruined. Yeah. 
the car died in front of the shop, yeah. like in front of Sam's, yeah. in that parking lot. Yeah. And Michael fixed it, and like none of the gauges worked. Mm-hmm. Nothing worked in it, basically. Mm-hmm. Michael fixed it. He had two gauge pods up here. He fixed it, fixed the tail lights, and everything. Was yeah. Three days later, he comes back and tells Michael he destroyed his car. <laughs> the guy had moved his gauge clusters, the gauges, into like a cardboard cutout. Yeah. Yeah. And he told Michael he was going to fix his car. Yeah. Michael told him, no, it is not. <laughs> he told Michael he was going to pay a $300 ticket he got for not having no tail light because he destroyed his car. Yeah. 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 Well, that's always trying to put something awful. So if you work on somebody's car and they've been doing that much work on their car, yeah. actually, that typically turns into a disaster anyway. That's you know? what happened. And you, you see that. Some of, you're just going to have to deal with customers like that sometimes. You told me you were going to burn down the shop. Yeah. Yeah, well. Customers have been Jerry rigging their old stuff. Yeah. Well, anyway. <laughs> um, which, uh, which energy sources are currently being used to help reduce the use of fossil fuels? Wind power. Hydroelectric. D and uh, B and C. B and C. B and C. Oh, How does hydroelectric power, power work? Through a dam. Huh? A dam. And then I mean, tell me how it works. Yeah, it goes through flows to the generator. Yeah, through a turbine. A turbine, turbine, turbine and the turbine, turbine turns the generator. But they actually control the water that's going through there. Yeah, like a grist mill. Huh? Like a gold grist. Vaguely, yeah. yeah. Except it spins it faster. The turbine spins faster than a grist mill. Pretty much like a. The like water wheel, powered by like a you know, river or something. you'd have the water wheel that would be turned by the river, and then you've got a shaft going in there, and it turns some machinery yeah. that it grinds the corn out. Oh, yeah. uh, what's the most abundant element on Earth? Uh, it's either water or oxygen. Hydrogen, believe it or not. Hydrogen? Yeah, hydrogen. But i tell you something else. Uh, the most abundant rock is granite. Granite. It's it just there's more granite on the earth than there is anything else, and it's the only rock on earth that we cannot make. Really? We can't make granite. We can make diamonds. We can make all kind of other make stuff. Diamonds? Yeah, you take coal and you put it under compression, you're making diamonds. Right. You can actually make you can make coal. You can make all kinds of stuff, but you can't make granite. Diamonds. And How granite. Do you make coal? Uh, well, you got to do what to. You just got to have plant. It's carbon is basically what it is. Uh-huh. And if you put it through the right kind of pressure and everything. See, coal's on the way to being diamonds anyway. It's so if you start right. making your, you know, you, t- you take plant matter and you smoosh it down, it's going to turn into carbon, which is the black stuff, you know, and then it, it turns into coal. And so, then you keep squeezing it and it becomes diamonds. So diamonds are getting diamonds, coal. diamonds are nothing but coal that's been squeezed. Yeah, I know that, but they're getting less and less expensive, dude. Yeah, I know. Because somebody can make them. Well, that's what well I, I know, but they're uh, real diamonds. Well, they play, they play, they play, they play uh, with diamonds in the street in South Africa. Little kids are playing marble with diamonds that are, that are natural diamonds down there. They're all over the place down that way. Why are they killing them? Yeah. Well, because they don't know that they can go to South Africa and get them from the kids. But anyway, <laughs> but anyway uh, polonium halos, the polonium halos in granite, from what I've been able to read, uh, polonium is a peculiar element that's trapped in granite and it's got a half life of like five minutes. What? And because of those polonium, the polonium halos that are in granite, or proof positive that the earth was formed in less than 90 minutes. Seriously? Yeah. You cannot, that because of the polonium halos, they wouldn't be there if it took a long time. You know what I'm saying? But the polonium halos in granite prove that the earth was formed in less than 90 minutes. But there, nobody wants to talk about that. But it's just, and granite's the most plentiful uh, stuff on earth. And it won't wash away when the water hits it. That's why they line a lot of these things with granite, you know, these... Uh, Places where water's going to be washing, it won't wash granite away. Really? Yeah. It won't erode? Yeah, it won't erode. Yeah, granite is tough stuff. It's tough stuff. In Texas, they have red granite, a lot of red granite. Oh, well, that's Texas. That's a place where they got a lot of Okay, I, how did I get off on that? I'm sorry. Know, it's, it's how, energy, uh, how energy efficient is a typical internal combustion engine? 4 to 60. Mm, uh, 15, 20. None of these are correct. Don't it stop, should be yes. about 25 to 30. 15 to 20 is what he's got. He's, that's the right answer. 15, 15 to 20. Here Brandon got it. Give Brandon a gold star. Go Don't throw it at him. Okay. Which term describes the entire fuel cycle from the time a fuel is extracted or in, extracted or produced until it is spent in the vehicle? <clears throat> Figure it out, guys. That's not a hard question to answer. Which term, it's, wait a minute. What about well to wheel? Oil well to wheel. Uh, 
my dad worked in the oil field, and he said that uh, he said that oil, the, the best grade of oil, if you pump it out of the ground, if you put it in a fruit jar, it's a light green color. You can see through it; it almost looks like any fruit. Really? And last week, fruit. Yeah, it's uh, you know you used to see it being black. Yeah. They that really. And I got this other stuff called drip. It's a byproduct of some of that stuff. And some of these farmers run that in their pickups. <laughs> they just catch it, you know, and pour it in there and it run. But uh, they claimed it if you run it for very long and mess them up. My boss man, when I was living in Texas, had a Mercedes diesel, brand new, with thirty thousand dollars he paid for it. Believe it or not, in nineteen eighty, you get a brand new Mercedes for thirty thirty k. It's uh, for the three hundred SEL or whatever it was. Right. But anyway, uh, he was running uh, helicopter fuel in it. You know, because he had a bunch of helicopters. I mean, we had helicopters. In a diesel? Yeah. And uh, he... Uh, you blew it up? No, I didn't blow it up, but it messed up the injector pump. <laughs> it wasn't lubricating the injector pump. It was too hot and too dry. He ran it for a while, you know, before he started having trouble. And then it wouldn't... It got to where it wouldn't run right. But he had crazy ideas about stuff and all that. I heard yeah. if you yeah. run a regular car hot enough, you could run a little bit of diesel in it. Yeah, you can. You can run a little diesel in there. Yeah. Uh, we've actually... I've actually had seen that happen. People put diesel in there. And uh, David Buck was so funny. I was telling him that story about this Taurus I worked on that somebody had added some diesel to. It was a rental car. And as long, I was trying to figure out why the darn thing wouldn't, you crank it up cold, it wouldn't hardly stay alive and it'd die and all that crap. Finally, I got it, if you could ever keep it running until it would warm up a little, it would smoke a little bit out of the exhaust pipe, but it was sealing the ring so well, that thing was had more compression, like 210 pounds on every cylinder. It's supposed to have like 160. And you get out on the road, that thing run like a Mustang. Boy, it just fly. <laughs> and I said, whoa, it had a little lever knock to it. And uh, even the guy from Ford was down there. I said, this thing's running bad. I'm not sure why. And he goes, uh, what's the compression on it? You know, because I said, well, it's 210 on every cylinder. He goes, what? I said, yeah, it's high across the board. And the shop foreman said, hey, I got nothing to do with anything. I said, yes, it does. You're 50 pounds higher on every cylinder. It's got to have something to do with it. Well, we tucked, I mean, you get some gas on your hand, you do it like this, and then you smell diesel. Oh, he put diesel in there. Well, I told David Buck about how much better that one ran. So first thing he did was stop by the gas station, put him some money, put diesel in his truck, try to get it run better. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like him. Yeah, well, look, we had a depot one night, y'all, yeah. and they rigged up a NOS bottle, and he run that truck on straight Yeah, on a, through a water hose. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, and did you know that little truck? I swear to God, when he done that. It would sit there and melt the tires off of it. Yeah, and he said that uh, what uh, what totally astonished. It was a '96. Ford Four Ranger nine. with a 2.5 in it. He outrun a Mustang, y'all. I mean, literally <laughs> yeah. walked off and outrun yeah. a Mustang. Well, and, it, it, and what happened, what amazed him when he told me, he didn't, now I found out about this later after he came and said, hey, can we look through what's going on with my truck? Uh, it was, uh, well, no, it, it actually didn't do that. It, it threw rods and stuff. There was pieces of rods in the oil pan and all that kind of hogwash. I took pictures of it, but uh, somewhere I got but anyhow, uh, he he said that uh, what really surprised me was how long that thing stayed together. That yeah, little thing was, was it. it was tough. Six seven thousand RPMs. Yeah, it was. He was just screaming. I mean, uh, the, that little that was a testimonial to how tough that little motor was for him running straight nitrous in there with a with with a water hose like a garden hose. <laughs> garden hose. <laughs> yeah, he's running it in there. Garden hose. Screw it onto the end of the off bottle. Yeah. So I didn't think you. I didn't know you were there when he did that, but he says uh, his mother called me and she says, uh, "Is it possible to find out if he did something that caused that truck to blow up, or if it, he said it just come apart and he didn't have no wine?" <laughs> and I says, "And I said, uh, and he was he was listening to me when I was talking on the phone. I said, well, we get it tore apart, we'll know if he was abusing it.'" And he goes, uh, "Is that right?" Uh, <laughs> he didn't want to. He didn't want to go there. I mean, he was wanting to snowball his mama, and I was going to tell her the truth, and he didn't like that. But anyway, wasn't a big deal. But uh, he, he basically, he was a nice little truck, and he basically just trashed it, just having fun with it at one night. But, uh, anyway, yeah, he's a piece of work. I'm telling you, that boy. Yeah, he, you know. Well, you saw the David Buck video about him going, you know, talking, sitting in my office, eating the sausage, and all that. All right. Well, you don't know what they're doing. Yeah. But, uh, technician A <laughs> says, no, wait a minute. Which of the following describes why it is fuel cell technology is not in mass production? All of these vehicles are reasons vehicles. And we've got insufficient power density, lack of durability, and high cost. It sounds like a good idea, but, you know, it ain't working. Uh, Technician A says fuel cells are categorized according to the type of electrolyte used. Technician B says all fuel cells operate most efficiently at 500 degrees Fahrenheit. 
That's actually technician A. Yeah. How would you like to be sitting on a fuel cell at 500 degrees for now? Well, your catalytic converter is running at 15, 1600 degrees something. Yeah, but it's not very big. No, it's not. Which fuel cell is best suited to automotive application? C. PIM. There you go. Technician A says that PAFC fuel cells use hydrogen as fuel. Technician B says PM fuel cells use hydrogen as fuel. Both technicians are correct. The negative electrode in a fuel cell is called? Yeah, right here. That's right. See this little LED that I just dropped on my keyboard here? It has an anode and a cathode, too. That little LED. Right there. It's an anode, right? Yep. Anode. Anode. Anode and cathode. What type of electrical current does a fuel cell generate? Mm -hmm. Direct current. Come on. Technician A says electrons in a fuel cell flow from the cathode to the anode. Technician B says electrons in a fuel cell flow from the anode to the cathode. In other words, that's backwards, right? Which technician is correct? Uh, that would be technician B. They flow from the anode to the cathode. And what is that? Is that from that's from negative to positive, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Electrons are charged. What? What's electrons charged? Negative, negative or positive? Negative. They're negative, right? Okay. So why is it that conventional theory says current flows from positive to negative, and electronic theory says it flows from negative to positive? Mm -hmm. Which way is the hole going? Huh? The hole. The hole. Yeah, you know, whenever the electrons are jumping, they're leaving a hole. Every time it jumps, it leaves a hole. The hole's flowing the opposite direction from the electron. Okay, if I've got an atom here, I can try to do this. That if uh, Brandon keeps yawning, he'll turn into a skeleton over there. Uh, All right. This is the, so now watch this. This is the, this is the, we're going to let's put a, an atom here. Right. Neutrons. Right. Neutrons and protons. Right. You got electron ring. Right. Like that. Several electrons around. Now, if I've got, how far is it from here to that electron ring? I'm gonna bring this. I'm gonna bring this. Uh, elect, I'm gonna bring the nucleus of an atom up to the size of that. Okay, how far away is the first electron ring? It would be almost like it was a thousand. Uh, you gotta know how many atoms and protons. How many? No, I mean it's just the nucleus of a, of a standard atom, whatever. Just the first electron ring is how far away? It would be like a person in a football field or something. He's smart. It's a long way off. It's like uh, yes, it's like uh, two, three hundred yards away. Uh, if it was the size of a baseball, it'd be two, or three miles away. So what you're saying is that atoms mostly empty space anyway. Yeah. Now we've got we're made out of mostly empty space. This is made out of mostly empty space. The empty space is bumping against empty space, but they're all the same sort of deal. And furthermore, electrons only behave as particles when they're being observed. They know when you're watching them. And that's why maybe some of these nuclear physicists, you know, I mean, these uh, particle physicists shut their shut head because they realize this is all this big video game, right? <laughs> Pretty much. Isn't it? Well, think about what that means. If they know you're watching them, that means that there's something out there, okay? All right, now then. Well, that, well, that's not no joke. That's for real. What? He's saying that for real. They know when you're watching them. Yep. I didn't make that up. I heard that before, but I never just really took it seriously. It's serious. That's the way it is. And that's what there was one, I kid you, one particle physicist that when he started thinking about what that meant, he actually killed himself. He couldn't handle it. He went crazy, you know, because he, cause he realized that, you know, this is basically we're all in a sort of a big video game, you know. Go plug right with that. All right, so. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, what? Uh, let me see. Hold on a second. That was actually B on that, number 20. What term describes the process of passing electrical current through water to break it into oxygen and hydrogen? Electrolysis. You ever done that? I wanted to. I did it. We did it here. You remember how you do that? How you do it? Well, Let's you, talk about you that. Put, you put an electrolyte in a water solution and put to, uh, you put a source of power to it. See this? Watch this. I'm going to take and I'm going to put some plates right here all right these plates right here are going to all be hooked to positive and these plates right here are all going to be negative. these plates aren't touching each other nowhere got it all right i mean i actually did that wrong excuse me but i'm going to do this right here and i'm going to hook i'm going to not that one the ones that aren't touching each other 
I got the wrong number. But anyway, every other one is positive, and the other one's negative. You, you can see what I'm talking about. You got to insulate them so they can't touch each other. No power can flow. Except you're going to submerge this assembly in some water with baking soda in it, which is alkaline, right? which is the opposite of acid. Right, it's got to be that unbalanced. And whenever you start flowing current through there, if you capture the gas that comes out of it, you get HHO gas, which is flammable. Really? Mm -hmm. You can do that. Will it blow up? Huh? Will it blow up? Well, when my son was building one, down at my, well, my two boys were together down at, in Augusta at my youngest son's house. And they were down there in my youngest son's garage. And my oldest son got a bunch of razor blades. And he put them together with little, you know, plastic bolts and washers and all that kind of stuff. And he soldered some stuff on there. And he made it, you know, my, he's in the Navy anyway, so he knows about nuclear stuff and all that stuff. And he was sourcing around with it. But anyway, he put that thing down there. He charged it up. And it starts boiling. And Luke says, the youngest son, he says, I wonder if that's really... You know, they were both in there, both about your age, you know, both of them are close to your age. And he said, I wonder if that's really flammable. So he threw a match down there. Boom! It went, went all, <laughs> it went all over this. I can't believe he did that. He destroyed everything I just built. Now i got to start over. Well, I put a, uh, I built one of these things, and I put it on my pickup truck. I mean, on my Jeep. So then just piped it in there so that it would boil, and you know, you got to keep water in there. In the and, and you got to have a fuse where if you short side, it'll blow. Anyway, uh, my gas mileage went from 21 down to 17. <laughs> but, I mean, it was making a difference, you know, but it was not a good difference. And, you know, they talk about oxygen sensors picking it up and changing the fuel flow and blah, 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 blah. But I've got plans for a carburetor that you can build. It'll give you 100 miles to the gallon if anybody wants to talk about that. Let's talk about that. You can build it out of a syrup bucket and a... With some copper tubing and not a big deal. It's fairly, be fairly simple to do. I'll draw a diagram on the board you know, if you want to see it later. But I, Wes is actually th thinking this is a bunch of hooey. You know, it ain't that right, Wes? No. If you think it's hooey because it's suppressed technology. Yeah. I bet I'd probably get in trouble putting that on YouTube. But. You would. Okay. It'd be like a movie change. Oh, I thought it was kill you. <laughs> All right, what? Okay, there you go. The chemical reaction in fuel cells is called electrolysis. That's false. It's not. It's not. Technician A says hydrogen is a fuel source for a fuel cell. Technician B says hydrogen uh, is energy carrier for a fuel cell. Technician B is the right guy about that, right? All right, we've got we to move quick now. Technician A says hydrogen exists by itself in nature. That's what they had in the Hindenburg. Hydrogen is unstable. Why is hydrogen unstable? Because it has only one valence electron. Uh, it's actually got only, it's, it needs a, a pro, it's only got a proton and an electron. It needs a proton and a neutron and an electron. I'm sorry, it's got a neutron and an electron. And, it and it's got to have a proton to balance the electron. See, so anything that's got an odd number it's is unstable. Thing. Yeah, see what I'm saying? Uh, uh, all right. uh, uh, Not anything around that side of the chart was unstable. That like sodium oh. will react with moisture and explode. Yeah, that's right, exactly right. And did you know these valves? Uh, wherever this valve is, like I said right here, these valves have sodium in the stem, some of them do. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. But be careful when you're grinding into one of those. You could have a record-breaking explosion there. <laughs> I'm serious. They, they actually tell you that in some of the automotive textbooks. Don't grind into a valve stem because there's sodium in there. Yeah. I know that. All right. Yeah. Um, let's see. Which of the following is produced during the fuel cell energy production uh, process? Water. That ain't hard. We've already been there. Number 24, Tec number 24 is going to be a B. Uh, that means that uh, hydrogen has better specific energy than fossil fuels. Yeah, but, you know. Um, technician A says fuel cell vehicles may use an electric storage device. Technician B says fuel cell vehicles that use a storage device to help power the vehicle are called fuel cell hybrid vehicle. Both of those guys are right. According to the text, what gas can disable the catalyst if it contaminates the PIM fuel cell? Carbon monoxide. That ain't all it will contaminate. It will contaminate you if you breathe it, too. Uh, techni uh, technician A says a fuel cell stack consists of a number of fuel cells in parallel. Technician B says a fuel cell stack consists of a number of fuel cells connected in series. It's B's who it is. You're going to cook them up? You're going to go up in series. 
Technician A says fuel cells produce large amounts of heat. Technician B says the fuel cell energy production creates low-grade heat. Technician B is right. All right. Technician A says fuel cell cooling systems can use heat exchangers with small surface areas. Can they? Any idea? Brandon, have you turned into a skeleton over there? All right. Yeah, at least on the burning. Yeah. Technician B says fuel cell cooling systems must use heat exchangers with large surface areas. B. And which gas is generally considered to be the rich indicator? Hydrocarbon or B? Well, you're close, but no cigar. Um, if uh, if you're running a slightly rich mixture, you're going to get carbon monoxide. Remember why I told you about that? Because every oxygen, I mean, every uh, carbon molecule wants to get married to two molecules of oxygen. I have my drift car. And if there's not enough for each one to have two, you're going to have one and one. Got too much gas. Then. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, and if you got so, if you got enough to where none of the, I mean, where you've got molecules that ain't getting no oxygen, that's hydrocarbons. <laughs> so you get hydrocarbons when that when when you got molecules coming out that ain't got none. If you just got one. You know, it's just going to be, it's going to read. You can read it. we got an exhaust gas analyzer right here that we, when we're teaching emissions and all that that we go over. Right. And, all, and it's pretty handy stuff. It's not a five gas. It's just a four gas, but it's really slick to watch that work. And it helps you to understand it better. I had my drift car running the rich system in my truck one time. I heard it in 1143 to 1. Mm-hmm. It got bad. I'm going to take time. Cool. Well, know. I'll tell you what. This one guy was working on his car kind of like you were doing in that trunk of that car full of that gas and I put that fan on you you know to blow that fumes out there uh, this guy was that was that I was working with at the Ford place was working under this car and for some reason or another the gas fumes you know how they got their head in there anyway and he just was kind of laying there and somebody says Mark hey Mark he said nothing so anyway they dragged him by the heel I mean he had a little creeper dragged him out from under the car and he was just Whoopee. Start smelling gas. Well, I went out this, on this motor home. He didn't mean to do it on purpose, you know. He didn't do it back. But anyway, here's this uh, fuel pump and this gas, I mean, this gas, the 80 gallon gas tanks. Now, these motor homes, they come in here with these motor homes and they say, we were losing power and it was cutting up and all this. So we put a fuel filter on it, filled it up with gas, and it's still cutting up. So I popped the engine cover off and pulled a fuel pressure regulator hose and snapped the throttle in to see the fuel pressure drop. And I said, well, it's got to have a fuel pump. <laughs> and so the, the darn thing's got 80 gallons of gas in it. I mean, I'm sorry, 80 gallons is real. We don't have anything to tank 80 gallons of gas, you know. So what I did was I actually rigged it with, a, with some all threads and some special deep sockets I made. And uh, there's some on the entry. i got to show you. That. Hey, this is great stuff. Okay, you're going to do this one day. I ain't working on it. Anymore. Yeah, you are too. You'll work on it and like it because it's going to pay you $30 an hour to work on it. Okay. See, the gas tank was like this. And there were straps around it, but right here on the very end of it, it had these little uh, bosses that were, there was a bolt going through there, right? Okay, but it had the straps too. Okay, I take these bolts out first, the straps I'm talking about around it like this. Mm-hmm. I take the bolts out first, and I would put me, uh, with a nut on top, a piece of all thread extending way down like this. And I built me a special socket that was built in all up and I'd put the bolt, I mean, on both ends of it. I had a long bolt down like that. And then I'd take the straps loose because these tanks, these were holding, right? And then, when I'd also take the filler hose off and everything else I had to take off to get it down. And then I would take my two air ratchets with them two deep sockets I put on there. And I'd go, and a gas tank would just come on down to the ground. And then I would change the pump. And then when I got, and then when I got through changing the pump, it paid six hours to change that pump. I could do it in 45 minutes. But uh, but anyway, uh, and it, I mean it was a legitimate heavy duty charge because big old aggravating son of a gun. But I found a, a shortcut, and it was safe, you see. And so what happens then is, see, I've still got all this hooked up, and I get my air ratchets and I put it on there, and you just pick that gas tank right back up. Put the straps up. back on it. And then yeah, put the strap. I'm done. Just that quick. I mean, and, 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 and these people are back on the road, you know. And they're more, and these motor homeowners, they're more than glad to shuck out six hours worth of labor because they want to get on the road again, and they're rich anyway. And they're usually the inside of the motorhome smells like a dog because they got a dog with them. Yep. <laughs> but anyway, that was what I did on there. But long and short of it was some of them, you didn't have to do that or, or were set up this way, but you could reach up in there and get to the pump. 
and you could take it out, and you'd have to fight these long arms. Now, he probably wouldn't have trouble. He got long arms. And my son Matt, you know, his arms. I probably wouldn't. I could probably crawl. Yeah, over. Matt could just about sit here, sit right here where we are, and just about slap Sean because that's how long his arms are. But anyway, <laughs> he did. I ain't kidding. He'd reach out of, of this far out the opposite door of the car. But anyway, he says, uh, I took that thing out, and I was thinking, I don't even be breathing these fumes. And I don't need nothing that's going to make a spark. Well, I put a squirrel cage fan I had up in there blowing straight through because you could see all the way to the other side. And I put it, I mean, that fan was blowing all the gas fumes out the other side so I weren't breathing that nonsense. You know, you gotta, be, you got to think ahead. Thank you. And he said that one guy lit a match to see how much fuel was in that big armor-plated... Uh, Mad Max truck. Yeah, uh, Mad Max truck that the Army uses now and blew it up. Boom! And uh, they, they met a vacuum to Germany and then they sent him a bill for that truck. Yeah. Woo! How much? That's if not if not a million or so, hundreds and hundreds of thousands. <laughs> well, that's pretty bad. So you know, yeah. yeah, they make you pay for negligence like that. Yeah, if you're doing something stupid, and you destroy a tank. You got to buy the tank. Did he get kicked down? I'm pretty sure he got medically discharged, but. Uh,